After the campaign on Varda VII, the machines of the Steel Legion, in whose restoration he was to partake, were awaiting him. When his mentor, Magos Skaletnesia, informed Christian that he had nearly completed his training, the tech priest was happy. However, as soon as he saw the endless rows of machinery, he immediately realized that before Nessia threw him out into the cold, he would have to relieve his mentor of a huge headache. But since Christian had seen the combat equipment of the Imperial Guard only from a distance, and only a few times, mainly engaged in repairing laser guns and armor, he was handed a stack of data pads with descriptions and technical information, which the dejected tech priest, armed with a huge amount of recaf, began to read. Fabricator locum Andrastia decima. Description of Imperial Equipment, Part 8. The Chimera and the Transports based on its chassis. For familiarization by the loyal servants of Nessia, unauthorized access is punishable by death. After disintegration, the information carrier should be re-illuminated. The Chimera is a multifunctional combat vehicle that has faithfully and gloriously served the Imperium for millennia, taking various forms from an armoured personnel carrier to a self-propelled artillery platform. The standard version of the Chimera is equipped with a multi-laser and a hull-mounted heavy bolter. This weaponry can be replaced with other heavy armaments, thereby increasing the multi-purpose nature of the APC. Throughout its time in service to humanity, the Chimera has repeatedly proven its reliability and value. Everyone, from the soldiers of the Astra Militarum and the stormtroopers of the mighty Inquisition to mercenaries and planetary defense forces, appreciates the Chimera for its versatility and ability to traverse the most unfavorable conditions. The tracks of this APC can overcome nearly any terrain, and its design features also allow it to ford swamps, marshlands, and even rivers. Many enemy armies have been destroyed simply because their commanders were confident that flanks, covered by what they believed to be impassable obstacles, provided protection from a sudden attack by the Imperial Guard. However, they then discovered that their army's headquarters were being attacked by companies of soldiers supported by the fire from their chimeras. Penetrating almost all of the Imperium's armed formations, the APC is quite well suited for any aspect of war. It is fairly durable and protects its passengers from any incoming fire, except volleys of heavy weaponry and artillery. Another tactical role of the Chimera is to shield tanks. Closer to the front line, soldiers disembark from the transport compartment and move forward to support the tanks. The Chimera's weapons can also provide fire support for advances in cases where infantry cannot use portable heavy weaponry or when squads are relocating. According to the standard doctrine for using a Chimera in combat, the crew should open the rear hatch of the armoured personnel carrier as they approach the target, allowing infantry to quickly disembark and begin their assault. Simultaneously with the deployment of the troops, the Chimera's weapons should open fire on the target. As the squad advances, the vehicle should retreat and find a fortified position to support the guardsmen with fire if necessary. Remain in position until it becomes necessary to evacuate the troops or move to the next objective. Besides its firepower, protection and mobility, the Chimera offers several other crucial advantages for the infantry. Guardsmen do not need to carry their combat gear themselves, reducing fatigue during long marches. Additionally, the Chimera is often equipped with extra gear and equipment, such as medkits and radios, allowing the infantry to receive orders and information from command during the battle. Moreover, the transport provides ample storage space for ammunition, making mechanized infantry a more effective force than regular soldiers. Understanding the advantages of mechanized infantry, many Imperial generals began forming so-called armoured fists, entire companies consisting of chimeras. However, as not all planets can afford to maintain such a large number of vehicles, some regiments might be assigned an armoured fist detachment from other fully mechanized regiments. On the battlefield, these units are capable of rapidly responding to emerging threats or advancing at the vanguard of the Imperial forces to secure strategic points until less mobile forces arrive. Armoured fists succeed at this task, 
as the heavy weapons of the Chimera firing at enemy positions allowed the disembarked infantry to shoot survivors at close range. Additionally, the spacious troop compartment allows the Chimera to transport not only regular guardsmen but also Ogrins, of which four can fit into an empty armoured personnel carrier. The most common model of the Chimera is the Mars pattern, armed with a multi-laser and a hull-mounted heavy bolter. Six laser guns are mounted in the transport's hull, operated by passengers. Another common model features a heavy bolter or flamer as the main weapon. This variant of the Chimera makes it an excellent support vehicle for infantry operating in urban environments. The Forge World Griffin IV specializes in producing Chimeras designed for exterminating infantry. Therefore, a twin-linked heavy bolter is installed in the turret of the armored personnel carrier, which, while not as effective against vehicles, is excellently suited for countering the dense infantry formations favored by orcs and tyranids. For combating armored units, the main weapon can be replaced with an autocannon. Similar to other Imperial vehicles, Chimeras are equipped with additional armor, a hunter-killer missile launcher, bulldozer blades, spotlights, smoke launchers, and a turret-mounted heavy stubber or storm bolter. Apart from the standard models of Chimeras, there are also three special variants, Chimerax, Chimadon, and Chimero. These are also used and produced by the Imperium. Although they differ from the original, they retain its transport and amphibious capabilities. Among the three variants, the Chimerax is the most common, as it was initially designed as a mobile anti-aircraft artillery piece. Armed with quad auto cannons, the Chimerax was also supposed to serve as a transport that provides direct fire support to the infantry. However, the auto cannons of this armored personnel carrier were ineffective against aircraft, and soon the Chimerax was replaced by the more advanced and efficient Hydra, remaining in the ranks only as a regular transport. Unlike the Chimerax, the Chimadon was conceived not as an armoured personnel carrier, but as a light tank. Armed with a Conqueror cannon, it was intended to provide fire cover for slower battle tanks. There were also attempts to upgrade the Chimadon, which included replacing the Conqueror cannon with a full-fledged battle cannon. However, during tests, the strong recoil of this weapon damaged the chassis of the vehicle, and therefore this idea had to be abandoned. The Chimero turned out to be more successful than the Chimadon. Armed either with a hunter-killer missile launcher with an automatic reloading system, or a salvo fire system with blocks of eight rockets, the Chimero quickly gained popularity in the ranks. In the process of operation, the first variant of the Chimero gradually fell out of favor, while the one armed with the salvo fire system became quite popular, as its missile launcher was useful for providing fire support during assaults on heavily fortified positions. In addition to all the aforementioned, there are also three more variations of the Chimera, the Assault Chimera, the APDS-6A Defender, and the Wheeled Chimera. The Wheeled Chimera represents a modified chassis of the standard Chimera that was converted to wheel drive instead of tracks. This variant is rarely encountered in regular guard regiments and special ops, but it gains significant popularity on frontier worlds, as it is much easier to produce and maintain in the conditions of a limited colonial economy. The APDS-6 A Defender is a variant of an armoured personnel carrier developed on the hive world of Armageddon. The Defender is armed with a hull-mounted heavy laser destroyer, thereby transforming from an armoured personnel carrier into a tank destroyer, used to support the Steel Legion, and other Imperial units during the siege of this planet. The transport proved to be an effective temporary measure. During the Orc invasion, however, there are no records of it appearing outside this planet. In turn, the Assault Chimera was specially developed for the regiments of the Death Corps of Krieg, as Krieg's combat doctrine dictates that the Corps' troops should not rely on mechanized transport or use larger and heavier transports like the Gorgon for mass assaults. Therefore, the standard Chimera found no application in these regiments and is extremely rare, only appearing as a modified version. The Assault Chimera is intended specifically for forward assault units and represents an upgraded standard Chimera reinforced with applique armor, 
armed with an auto cannon instead of a multi laser, both to increase firepower and simplify ammunition resupply. However, based on the Chimera chassis, a reconnaissance vehicle was also developed named the Salamander, which is generally used either by the command units of an armored company or by armored reconnaissance squadrons. Its primary task is to support scouts located at a significant distance from the main forces and who occasionally require substantial fire support. Thus, armed with an autocannon and a heavy bolter, the Salamander is well suited for this task. Despite the fact that the Sentinel Walker model is also suitable for this task and has greater mobility, it lacks the firepower and armor to engage in prolonged combat with the enemy, unlike the Salamander. Of course, it cannot provide the same level of cover as battle tanks. However, due to its speed and some degree of firepower, this armored vehicle can save the lives of scouts who encounter ambushes. Moreover, being built on the Chimera chassis, the Salamander can also tow light vehicles damaged in ambushes. Since the Salamander spends a significant time far from the main units, their crews often push their engines to the limit to quickly escape from pursuing enemies too powerful to face directly. Although this violates the directives of the Adeptus Mechanicus, given the dangers faced by lightly equipped reconnaissance units far from repair stations, this modification is overlooked. Naturally, such engines have a shorter lifespan and require more frequent maintenance. Salamanders are often at the forefront of the offensive and periodically may encounter ambushes or enemy positions fortified with camouflaged units. During missions, reconnaissance groups often consist of two vehicles for mutual support and cover. While one vehicle moves, the other directs and covers it. The main task of any reconnaissance unit is to advance and lay routes for the main force grouping. Additionally, these vehicles are equipped with powerful communication equipment, allowing them to relay intelligence data to the rear. Often they have direct communication channels with command vehicles such as Leviathans and command tanks of the armored company. However, if a regiment holds the defense, salamanders are usually directed to the rear to perform policing and patrol functions. There is nothing surprising in seeing these armoured vehicles guarding ammunition depots and headquarters units or patrolling important routes together with sentinels. Only during a general offensive, reconnaissance units are called to perform so many duties that they often simply lack vehicles to fulfil all their tasks. In such cases, the shortage is made up for by armour-clad units with fist measures. Such a unit is temporarily directed from its native platoon to a reconnaissance company. Thus, patrols comprising armoured fist units and salamanders often operate together. Below are the technical specifications of the Vanheim model reconnaissance salamander. Also common among guard regiments is the command variant of the salamander, designed to transport command staff, ensure stable communication between units and manage combat. Many regiments use a separate chimera, equipped with communication equipment for this purpose. However, many officers still prefer the Salamander for its speed. The Command Salamander is armed with a hull-mounted heavy bolter and a frontal flamethrower, which can be replaced with another bolter. The Command Salamander is not intended for frontline combat and is more of a vehicle for transporting command staff across the battlefield. On the rear platform of the vehicle is sophisticated long-range communication equipment intended to constantly maintain contact with command, most often the captain, with his entrusted units, the regimental command, and the commanders of other companies. The crew of each vehicle includes a comms operator, specially trained to use complex communication equipment in combat conditions. The rest of the vehicle's crew consists of the staff of the command squad. Besides an officer and the operator, the Salamander also has a driver mechanic and a gunner. In the Vanheim model command Salamander, the driver mechanic is equipped with a multi-spectral scan servitor mounted in the hatch above their head. This technological equipment allows the vehicle to plot a safe route in low visibility and nighttime conditions. The combination of high speed, good protection and powerful communication equipment enables the Salamander to serve roles beyond that of a command vehicle. Some artillery units use the Salamander as a vehicle for directing and adjusting indirect fire. It is also frequently used by commissars as a personal transport. In cases where Trojans are scarce, 
The Command Salamander can function as a tractor for towing oversized heavy equipment, supplies and even ordnance. Aside from combat modifications, the Chimera chassis is also used to create tractors, one of which is the Trojan. This vehicle is employed as a field artillery tractor or supply transport that delivers ammunition to artillery batteries or frontline combat units. The Trojan is a non-combat vehicle and it is rarely seen on the front line during intense battles. Its place is behind the attacking units, where it shuttles between depots and equipment. Based on the Chimera chassis, the Trojan is extremely simple to manufacture and completely fulfills its assigned tasks of delivering ammunition or transporting weapons across any terrain found in the galaxy. However, due to its non-combat role, it is almost devoid of armor, weaponry, save for a hull-mounted heavy bolter medical equipment and most instruments which have been removed for greater capacity. Each tractor is equipped with a crane used for loading and unloading ammunition. However, the Trojan lacks the power to tow damaged equipment using its crane, which limits its use as a repair recovery vehicle, a role instead taken by the Atlas, created on the Lehman Russ tank chassis. In addition to its cargo-filled internal compartment, the tractor often hauls armoured trailers. This could include a large fuel tanker or a trailer with additional ammunition or with medical supplies, food, equipment and so forth. Despite the non-combat role of this vehicle, there are numerous records of unconventional field modifications of the Trojan. For example, some regiments in dire straits have used the tractor as an armoured vehicle, albeit with very weak armour, while others mounted autocannons on the Trojan transforming it into an improvised anti-aircraft system. Some have welded additional armour onto the tractor and, installing communications equipment, converted it into a mobile command post, while others, having more resources at their disposal, equipped the Trojan with mine-clearing devices or pontoon installations, turning it into an engineering tank. Although such modifications are prohibited and less effective than specialised vehicles, Many guard officers still prefer to incur the wrath of the Adeptus Mechanicus rather than be executed by a commissar for failure. The history of the Basilisk is shrouded in secrecy, yet Imperial records clearly indicate that it was in service with the Imperial Army, Mechanicum and the Space Marine Legions during the Great Crusade. In the Legions, the Basilisks were usually manned by mortal personnel, but in some cases by Space Marines themselves. However, the Basilisk did not become widely adopted among the Space Marines, as they preferred the more versatile Whirlwinds, which were based on the Rhino chassis. The Basilisk fleet was extensive. By the 41st millennium, this self-propelled gun had practically not changed, with only additional modules and upgrades long lost to the Imperium having disappeared. Using the same universal and unpretentious chassis as the Chimera, the Basilisk retains all its advantages except for the passenger compartment, which was replaced with an open gun platform protected at the front by an armoured shield. There are several models of the Basilisk produced at different Forge worlds. For instance, the Vanaheim model has a larger gun shield which protects soldiers not only from the front, but also from the sides, and the Armageddon Hades model which has a fully enclosed combat compartment. In battle, the Basilisk is used for direct artillery support of units fighting on the front lines. Unlike other self-propelled guns, the Basilisk is capable of firing not only in indirect fire mode, but also in direct fire, lowering the gun barrel to engage visible targets. Therefore, it is not uncommon for the Basilisk to move to the front lines and be transformed into a tank hunter or assault howitzer. However, Due to the vulnerability of the Chimera chassis, soldiers are horrified when the commander orders them to move into the thick of the battle. With a structure almost identical to that of the Chimera, the front compartment of the Basilisk houses the mechanic driver and the commander, who also operates a heavy bolter. The gun crew, consisting of a gunner and a loader, is on the rear platform. While the loader loads the heavy shell into the chamber, the gunner follows the commander's orders to aim and fire the Earthshaker cannon. The primary task of the Basilisk on the battlefield is to provide artillery support to frontline units. The fire of the Basilisks is directed by a spotter or any other senior officer of the Imperial Guard trained as a forward observer. 
For most tasks, the basilisk uses high-explosive shells, but in addition to these, the artillery piece has other types of specialized shells. Smoke, incendiary and illumination shells are used to light up the battlefield at night. The Earthshaker is a 132 mm caliber gun, capable of firing a shell to a distance of more than 15 kilometers at a speed of 814 meters per second. The power of the Earthshaker cannon is so great that it can easily destroy a tank, enemy fortification or building. Basilisks are often used for direct support of troops in battle. Thanks to its low elevation angle, the Earthshaker can be used as an assault gun with devastating effect on targets at close range. However, the Basilisk is not capable of replacing a battle tank. Its weak armour and open platform make it too vulnerable to enemy attacks, so it is used as an auxiliary vehicle. Therefore, possessing good mobility and firing range, the Basilisks perform excellently behind the front lines where the enemy is unable to retaliate against them. The heavy mortar installation Griffin is among the lightest of the artillery and siege tanks of the Imperial Guard, which are much smaller and more mobile than other artillery installations created on the Chimera chassis. The Griffin is used as an infantry fire support vehicle during offensive sieges, as well as for shelling enemies hiding behind walls. Many artillerymen of the Imperial Guard unfairly criticize the Griffin, believing it to lack range and firepower. Compared to its lesser brethren, its heavy mortar is too cumbersome for a human but not large enough to justify mounting on armoured vehicles. Mounted on a combat vehicle, the Griffin requires the same fire control and artillery reconnaissance system that is usually reserved for larger artillery companies. Due to these drawbacks, commanders of the Astra Militarum have practically allowed the Griffin to become something of a relic. Losses of combat units are often not replenished, leading to a steady decline in its production levels in Forge Worlds. However, despite its significant drawbacks, the Griffin still has some advantages over heavier artillery. When used correctly, it becomes a valuable addition to the arsenal of the Imperial Guard. The Griffin is the lightest artillery weapon in the Guard and demonstrates an ideal balance of weight, firepower, mobility and ease of use. The Griffin's mortar is capable of maintaining high firing speed and providing adequate firepower against enemy infantry and light vehicles, which in turn allows the heavier weapons to be redirected to fortified targets. Judicious use makes the Griffin an irreplaceable weapon for both barrage fire and direct fire support in offensive operations. Furthermore, when using different types of ammunition, it becomes an incredibly flexible tactical weapon. The Griffin's mortar is designed to use a wide range of various shells, from standard high explosive fragmentation, smoke and illumination, to siege rounds. When properly set, the high trajectory of the siege projectile allows it to burrow into the ground before detonating. This reduces the blast radius, making such a projectile less dangerous for infantry, but more effective against buildings and bunkers. On the Basilisk, the Griffin has a standard crew of four, the driver and the commander are in the front compartment, while the gunner and loader, who operate the mortar, are on the rear combat platform. The Medusa, also known as the Siege Self-Propelled Artillery Installation, was named after the siege cannon Medusa mounted on it. During sieges, this installation is used for breaching the walls of enemy fortifications, assisting infantry in storming fortified positions. Once a breach is created in the wall, the Medusas move forward to directly support the assault, demolishing entire buildings with a single shot. Street by street, they pulverize the city, leaving the enemy no cover. Among the guardsmen, the Medusa is considered an old veteran whose best days are long past. It is no longer seen as an essential part of the armored division, lacking the range of bombards, manticores or basilisks, as well as the heavy armor of destroyers or thunderers. As a result, over time, Medusas have become rarer in the Imperial Guard. They are usually brought into action when there is a need to breach a fortress shadow or destroy a well-defended bunker, and no destroyers are available in sufficient numbers. Each armoured regiment might have a battery of Medusas in reserve for emergency situations, but many commanders prefer not to use them unless absolutely necessary. Attempts have been made to repurpose the Medusa in other roles, but with little success. 
Its short range prevents its use as conventional field artillery, and when given to the infantry as a direct support vehicle, the lack of an armoured compartment makes the crew too vulnerable to enemy fire. For these tasks, destroyers or thunderers are better suited. Another drawback of the Medusa is its small ammunition capacity. Its seed shells are large, meaning that each installation can carry no more than 18 shells. For a stationary gun during a siege, this is not an issue, as new ammunition is constantly brought to it through supply trenches. On the battlefield, however, the Medusa cannot maintain prolonged fire. The self-propelled missile system Manticore is a formidable weapon in the arsenal of many regiments of the Astra Militarum. Although the Manticore is not as widespread as the Basilisk Earthshaker, its versatility gives it a distinct advantage over other artillery. Named after a fierce creature that lived in ancient times on Terra, the Manticore, like its mythical progenitor, is armed with four long-range missiles with various warheads. Despite the undeniable power of the Manticore, it is an ancient and demanding machine. Reloading the system requires several solar hours of meticulous and continuous work by tech priests and specialized servitors. This process is entirely impossible under combat conditions, which significantly limits the machine's ammunition. Furthermore, the machine spirits of these ancient war mechanisms are considered some of the most temperamental and quick-tempered. And if they are dissatisfied with the surrounding conditions or treated disrespectfully, the machine refuses to function. The missiles may veer off course significantly or simply explode in mid-air, and sometimes they don't launch at all, grumpily ignoring the activation runes. Therefore, the crew of the Manticore usually bows to their machine before and after battle, humbly seeking its permission for launch, and then thanking it for delivering the Emperor's wrath upon his enemies. During combat, the crew constantly recites litanies to placate the machine spirits. However, despite the unpredictability of the Manticore, many Imperial commanders believe that its utility outweighs the problems it poses. One such installation is equated in material value to entire batteries of simpler weaponry within the Departmento Munitorum and not without reason. When Manticores are attached to regiments of the Imperial Guard, most officers use them as a terror weapon, deploying them at key moments in battle to break the enemy's morale. The Manticore's salvo system is one of the most complex devices available to the Imperial Guard. Unlike the Basilisk, Manticores utilize a remote control system with audio modulation, gyroscopic stabilization for roll, and radar tracking. Manticores are also often used to perform a variety of roles and address any deficiencies in the ranks of the Astra Militarum. When equipped with anti-aircraft missiles, it replaces the Hydra. When armed with incendiary warheads, it becomes a devastating anti-infantry weapon, and with fragmentation high-explosive warheads, it is used for containing enemy tank formations. Each Manticore missile consists of five components, a fuse, control and guidance apparatus, electrical block, warhead and fuel block. It is also equipped with a two-stage solid-fuel rocket engine, consisting of a launch and a cruise stage. Thus, the projectile is capable of reaching a flight speed of up to 300 meters per second. Due to the limited number of available missiles, manticores are not as widespread as basilisks, and most bombardments are still carried out with standard artillery. The most common ammunition is the Storm Eagle missile. This ammunition is mounted on a single-stage booster and equipped with augers that control targeting and detonation. The warhead of this missile contains concentric racks filled with high-explosive bombs, each soaked with the sacred oils of the Adeptus Mechanicus and inscribed by hand with the litanies of 100 Songs of Wrath. The deafening roar of the approaching missile causes enemies to throw down their weapons and flee in terror, trying to save their lives. Directly above the target zone, the warhead opens, releasing a payload of bombs that covers a fairly extensive area. Upon detonation, the blasts can overturn tanks or completely vaporize them, along with any infantry. Those who are unlucky enough to be just a bit further from the explosion are left lying on the ash-covered ground with their mutilated, charred bodies. The Death Strike self-propelled rocket launcher serves as a mobile platform for launching Death Strike intercontinental ballistic missiles, after which it is named similarly to the Medusa. 
Despite its mass destruction munitions, this launcher is increasingly rare on the battlefields, as many commanders fear the harm it could cause to their own troops, preferring the less destructive but more reliable basilisks. As a result, the Death Strike is employed only on the most apocalyptic battlefields and only when the unit to which it is attached has received authorization from Segmentum Command. Upon receiving authorization, the launcher fires a single missile with a range of several thousand kilometers. Upon detonation, everything within the blast radius is immediately consumed by a thermonuclear fireball, vaporizing everything in its path, including both machines and buildings. One such missile is capable of obliterating entire enemy armies and sections of allied regiments if they are within the zone of impact. Therefore, when permission to use the launcher is granted, the Death Strike crews are assigned the most loyal and devout commissars who are tasked with ensuring the launch occurs regardless of the designated target or consequences that may befall Imperial forces. However, deploying such a launcher requires significant time and resources. Just obtaining permission can take months, as each missile fired by a Death Strike is extraordinarily costly. Moreover, readying the rocket launcher for combat takes considerable time. Each component of the missile needs to be properly anointed and lubricated with sacred oils while the Margos recites catechisms of manufacture. Then the tech priests proceed to the process of linking the guidance skulls to each of the warhead's drives, after which they commence the solemn ceremony of installing the missile onto the platform. However, due to the lengthy nature of this process, and because the death strike is required only in critical situations, it often arrives on the battlefield when the conflict has already concluded. However, this does not imply that death strike missile launchers are scarcely used, as their immense value and situational versatility are the stuff of legends. Since the warhead can carry various charges intended to inflict maximum damage, the death strike is capable of obliterating anything that might be encountered in the galaxy with a single salvo. Even godlike titans have been annihilated in the blaze of a thermonuclear sun, and disease-bearing organisms and bacteria have wiped out the core of enemy armies within minutes, including both command and rank-and-file troops. Yet the most terrifying charge of all is the Vortex Warhead, which upon detonation releases the seething energies of the warp into reality. This guarantees 100% destruction of everything within its blast radius. Vortex warheads are so rare within the Imperium that entire companies of soldiers are executed immediately for a mistaken launch. But such deadly weaponry also attracts unwanted enemy attention, and being mounted on a Chimera chassis, it remains vulnerable. Even the most brainless, beast-like Xenos recognize the threat of the launcher as it prepares for launch and instantly make it their priority target. However, most often held deep within the rear lines, the Death Strike launchers remain hidden, biding their time. When enemy forces finally assemble for a breakthrough or another sufficiently high priority target appears, waves of the Imperial Guard are sent into the thick of the battle to engage the enemy, after which, upon receiving coordinates, the Death Strike launches directly into the heart of the skirmish, annihilating both heretics and traitors, as well as faithful servants of the Emperor. Such measures are as inhumane as they are desperate. However, in such dire times, no sacrifice can be too great to ensure the survival of humanity. The technical data of the Death Strike rocket launcher is classified. The Hydra designed on the Chimera chassis is an anti-aircraft weapon system produced universally within the Imperium and is present in nearly every regiment of the Astra Militarum. The Hydra is used to protect important ground units, artillery companies, headquarters, armoured columns and supply convoys from enemy air raids. The powerful, rapid-firing guns of the Hydra are capable of turning enemy aircraft into smoking wreckage within a matter of seconds. In addition, the Hydra's autocannons perform admirably against advancing infantry and light vehicles. The autocannons of this armoured vehicle are so effective in eliminating infantry that some senior officers turn a blind eye to their subordinates using the Hydra outside its intended role. The Hydra's turret is equipped with targeting and tracking systems. Moreover, it is automated, so once an aircraft is caught in its sights, the guns will stay locked on despite any evasive manoeuvres. The Hydra's prognostic logistic spirit tracks targets with the tenacity of a predatory beast, 
Once a target is acquired, the loading automata commence their operation with a rising whine, while the Hydra's turret begins to rotate and the quad autocannons start firing, filling the sky with a wall of explosive shells. Given the high rate of fire of the Hydra, an aircraft is typically doomed. Hydras are assigned to a regimental anti-aircraft company, but among those companies, it is the least likely to be seen assembled together. The existence of the company is merely a nod to bureaucracy, as squadrons and even individual machines are inevitably split up and assigned to various units for air defence. The demand for Hydras always exceeds the regiment's capabilities, and a commander must carefully consider which asset requires such protection and which does not. Often artillery is given priority, as it is the primary target of enemy bombers, and many basilisk batteries are permanently assigned hydras. Forward tank companies are also vulnerable to air attacks without hydra cover, and the anti-aircraft tank often accompanies armour columns on the march. If hydras are unavailable, alternative arrangements must be made. Such temporary anti-aircraft tanks may include the exterminator, chimera or other converted vehicles. Command units and important supply depots are next in line for air attack protection, but they are generally stationary enough that using such a valuable mobile platform like the Hydra for defence is inefficient. The Hydra's crew consists of five members. The mechanic driver, commander and comms operator are situated in the vehicle's hull, with one of them manning the heavy bolter. Meanwhile, the gunner and loader are positioned in the turret, managing the quad autocannons. The Wyvern is a modification of the Hydra, in which the autocannons have been replaced with mortars, transforming the anti-aircraft unit into a short-range, self-propelled artillery piece. Although the Wyvern lacks the range and power of the Basilisk, it is excellently suited for urban warfare in confined spaces. The Wyvern uses an outdated version of the automatic targeting system which continuously scans the surrounding area to detect concentrations of infantry. The machine spirits of these tanks are known for their malevolent nature and at times independently keep the first enemies encountered in their sights, disregarding the crew's commands. Each successful hit only fuels the hunting fervour of the machine spirit and elicits a satisfied growl as it searches for the next victim. The sound of the mortar in the Wyvern is well known to the Xenos and traitors who have already encountered this armoured vehicle on their path, and they are well aware of what follows. In urban battles on narrow streets, the whistling means only one thing, imminent death. Few things in the galaxy can inspire the average soldier who is fighting against a superior opponent as much as the sight of haughty Eldar and bloodthirsty orcs being blown apart by another mortar bombardment. The salvos from the Wyvern are not only effective in eliminating enemy personnel, but also significantly demoralize them as an experienced crew can destroy any enemy, be it the superfast jet bikes of the Xenos or the terrifying Terminators of Chaos. A battery of Wyverns can clear an entire street of advancing enemies in just a few minutes, and considering that the mines explode in the air, the shrapnel can find a hidden enemy anywhere, from craters and trenches to armoured shields and barricades. The technical characteristics of this armoured vehicle are similar to those of the Hydra with the exception of its armament. Armed with an Inferno cannon, the Hellhound unleashes streams of Prometheum, incinerating advancing enemies or those who have chosen to endure the firestorm in a bunker. The Hellhound is widely used by the Imperial Guard as a support vehicle during urban and jungle combat. Hellhounds are incorporated into special tank companies or attached to armoured fist units and other tank companies as support vehicles. Despite the fact that some regiments are fortunate enough to acquire an entire company of flamethrower tanks, many commanders adopt a flexible approach in their deployment. In their opinion, Hellhounds are more useful as independent units that can be attached to combat or assault squads as needed. Hellhounds are not intended for battle in full companies, unlike Lemon Rust tanks. As with other Imperial machinery, Hellhounds come in a multitude of different models. Though apart from minor external differences, their main characteristics are quite similar. All flamethrower tanks have a large armoured fuel tank with a massive Prometheum reserve to keep the Inferno cannon operational throughout the battle. Most flamethrower weapons suffer from a lack of ammunition because any flamethrower requires a considerable amount of fuel. 
This is not a problem for hellhounds, thanks to the large quantity of Prometheum they carry. However, despite its effectiveness in close combat, the range remains the primary limitation of this machine. Many Imperial officers, aware that a fully armed hellhound is essentially a massive incendiary bomb on tracks that will eventually detonate, prefer to crew these machines with guardsmen who have narrowly escaped execution or volunteers who fully understand the inherent dangers of operating this vehicle. However, the men and women comprising the Hellhound crews in Tanya relish their daredevil reputation and take pride in it. Others, conversely seeing Xenos and heretics burn in the flames of justice, start to view such a punishment as a calling and embark on a personal purifying crusade. But such zeal often leads to unnecessary risks and posthumous glory. There are multiple models of Hellhounds. For example, the Artemia pattern has a remotely operated gun, while some versions, including the Martian pattern, have a fuel tank located inside the Chimera's hull, almost entirely filling the transport compartment. Many commanders prefer this particular Hellhound design, as it makes the tank's shape and profile very similar to a standard Chimera, making it harder for the enemy to identify. This holds certain logic since commanders fear that due to its deadly armament, the enemy will prioritize destroying the Hellhound. To prevent a catastrophic explosion, each flamethrower tank is fitted with reinforced armor to protect the fuel tank. Two variants developed on the Hellhound's chassis include the Devil Dog, which, unlike the Hellhound, is equipped with a melter cannon instead of an inferno cannon. This makes it excellently suited for destroying not just infantry, but also armored vehicles. Its name is derived from the piercing howl of the Melter Cannon that reverberates with each shot, marking its joy in tearing through enemy machines. Indeed, many Devil Dog crew commanders consider their vehicles to be dedicated tank hunters, preferring not to be distracted by smaller prey, as the Melter Cannons on this machine are scaled-down versions of those mounted on Reaver and Warlord Titans. Although considerably smaller, it can still turn almost any armoured vehicle into a heap of molten wreckage. The enemy, forced to fight Imperial Guard regiments in rugged terrain during protracted campaigns, soon begins to fear every seemingly random passing chimera, expecting instead to encounter a devil dog. A common tactic of combining devil dogs and hellhounds into one squadron has become so prevalent that an entire page of the Tactica Imperialis is dedicated to their deadly union, referred to in the book as Squadron of Despair. Mixed squadrons are indeed effective on the battlefield, as the Hellhound, being vulnerable to armoured tanks, is covered in battle by Devil Dogs, which in turn are protected from incoming waves of infantry by a scorching wall of Prometheum. Working together, these two armoured vehicles quickly deal with any adversary. The technical specifications of the Devil Dog are similar to the Hellhound, except for their weaponry. In turn, the Bane Wolf at first glance resembles the same Hellhound, but first impressions are deceptive. Armed with a chemical cannon and having Prometheum replaced with poisonous gas in its tanks, the Bane Wolf is extremely dangerous to any infantry, including Space Marines in their power armor. The poisonous gas employed by the Bane Wolf was specially synthesized by the Magos Biologis and certified as hazardous to virtually all living creatures in the galaxy. Issuing forth as hissing streams, this gas is capable of dissolving ceramite chitin on contact within seconds, after which the victim, clad in seemingly reliable protection, begins to dissolve slowly. Blood boils, organs rupture, the skin is covered in bubbling wounds of chemical burns, and flesh peels away from crumbling bones, until eventually the victim turns into a sticky organic mush, which is ground under the tracks of the Bane Wolf. The sacred formula of the gas used in the chemical cannon may have been created by the Adeptus Mechanicus, and it is insisted that this be utilized in every chemical tank. Nonetheless, there are regiments that use their own improvised mixtures. For instance, there is a gas known as the Breath of the Penitent. It was used to suppress the revolt in the Savlar mines and proved to be fairly effective. However, the crews using it were executed for heresy. Nevertheless, it cannot be said that the loyal crews of the Bane Wolves are more pious people. Each of them is a reclusive, uncommunicative individual bearing a heavy burden. They rarely interact with other soldiers of their regiment due to the battles they have experienced, 
for a special disposition is required to lead such a grotesque and yet devastating weapon into combat. In their lives they have witnessed numerous uprisings where the gas in their machine's tanks turned not only heretic traitors or xenos into slime, but also ordinary rebels and possibly even guardsmen from other regiments whose loyalty was in question. Even so, the Bane Wolf is not often used in battle, as the risk of friendly fire is too great, and many officers prefer to deploy these machines only when the annihilation of all living beings in a specific combat sector is required. As for the technical specifications, they are similar to that of the Hellhound, with the exception of the armament. Before he could wipe the organic eyes from the prolonged exposure to the blue light of the informational tablet, Christian noticed that his mentor was looming over him. Receiving a new informational tablet from Magos, already with the designation of each armoured vehicle, the young tech adept, armed with new knowledge, embarked on a long journey between rows of standing chimeras and other equipment, meticulously inspecting each combat unit and entering the detected damages into the tablet.